This is Crosscut Reports. I'm Maliha Sayed. Today, we're taking a closer look at how climate change is affecting our mental health. People on social media are sharing their anxious feelings and fears about climate change. So much so, there's a name for this. It's called eco-anxiety or climate anxiety. Okay. It's hard to ignore climate change's impact on the planet as summers get hotter, wildfire seasons get longer, and sea levels continue to rise. On top of that, many people are experiencing an emotional fallout from all of these changes. In this episode, we speak with Jennifer Atkinson, an associate teaching professor at the University of Washington Bothell, about how climate anxiety and grief are impacting us, and how we can navigate through these fears to take action. I would like to know, for starters, what do you research and how has that evolved over time? Yeah, so I I come from the field of environmental humanities more broadly. So uh, look at the way that we sort of uh, imagine and respond to and represent environmental issues, not in the sciences, but in literature, in arts, in popular culture. So in recent years, I'd say in the last seven or eight years, I've really turned towards looking at the emotional landscape of our our warming world and how it's affecting people's mental health, particularly how it's affecting the mental health of students and their ability to learn and to respond creatively to the kinds of climate challenges that we're seeing. I, I'm currently working on a book that I'm co-editing with Sarah Jaquette Ray. Um, it's called uh, The Existential Toolkit for Climate Justice Educators. And I do the the same kind of work in my teaching, working with students. So my classes will work with students to study the role of emotion in public perception and response. So for example, what does the research say about how fear versus anger versus guilt versus hope or you know any particular emotion how does that influence people's responses to climate change also what motivates people what kinds of emotional resonance causes people to withdraw and then kind of the second level of my research is working with young people and students to help them explore their own emotional responses to ecological loss and to develop personal strategies to to cope with anxiety and hopelessness and burnout And I mean, part of the reason that I got into this work is just that over the years, I've seen students spiraling into despair and guilt and hopelessness. And that really interferes with their ability to learn, let alone to become the environmental leaders that we're trying to prepare them to become uh, at the University of Washington. So in a sense, this was just as much something that I felt like I had to do as something that I, I chose to do. Well, I was interested you had mentioned that you were seeing your students navigate climate anxiety or or dealing with sort of the stresses around that. What did that look like? What were you seeing with your students? Ah, uh, I, I everything that you can imagine. So responses from like a really intense sense of urgency, a sense of of personal and moral responsibility and guilt, uh, feelings that that. The efforts that they make are never enough, that the the worst is yet to come, uh, a sense that other people around them don't seem to care enough, and that can be really, really demoralizing. Exhaustion from, from swinging back and forth between feeling outraged or feeling de- depressed. Um, and then just, I, I would say probably the number one response that I get from students when I ask them, how do they feel about the future? How do they feel about climate change in general? And I'll, I'll run these surveys all the time uh, with my students is they just say they feel overwhelmed. And so that leads to burnout and a sense of numbness, a, a sense that they, well, I mean, just actually they do end up disengaging and, and withdrawing and becoming less engaged in the problem. On one hand, you have young people experiencing extreme anxiety about the future, right? So I hear all the time that they feel that they're not going to have the same access to opportunities that their parents had. They feel anticipatory grief. So that's kind of like a grief in anticipation that of the things that we value will be destroyed. So what is it going to be like to live in a world without coral reefs or without orcas here in the Puget Sound? Very, very often I hear from students that they feel reluctant to have children. So so that's this kind of sense for young people that 
Um, they're being robbed of their future. But it doesn't stop there because they're also being robbed of their present. Severe weather caused by climate change is creating flight cancellations, making people leave certain cities, and even impacting how and when people work. And that's where we see these kinds of anxieties and fears interfering with daily life, disrupting their sleep, interfering with their, their studies and their schoolwork, interfering with their ability to concentrate. And then also another kind of present dimension of climate anxiety is just this really profound sense of betrayal. And the research does show that that distress is far greater for young people when they feel that the the response of adults and governments and the people who are supposed to be protecting them is inadequate. So it's not that climate anxiety is a mental illness at all, but the impacts of climate change when they're paired with this governmental failure to act, that creates a, a, a chronic long-term stressor. And those stressors are very likely to increase the risk of developing mental health problems, especially when we're talking about vulnerable groups like children and young people who are facing these vast existential threats and stressors and are going to experience the brunt of it. You know, they'll still be around when the generation that's most responsible for this mess is gone. But those young people aren't in positions of power right now in order to pass legislation or make business decisions or take the kinds of policy actions that would reduce or pre prevent problems going forward. So it makes me think of a, a student who came to a class a year or two ago wearing a t-shirt. It was obviously targeted at older people and it said, you'll die of old age, we'll die of climate change. You know, one of your courses it's titled Eco Anxiety and Climate Grief. How do you define those two terms? What does that look like? Well, I mean, for eco anxiety, I guess the general definition is simply distress about the state of our planet, right? Climate change, mass extinction, toxic pollution, extreme weather, all the bad news that we encounter in the media and increasingly also experience in, in daily life. And this is really heavy stuff to deal with at any age, but for young people just starting off their lives, it can also manifest as, well, a kind of a sense that, you know, they're supposed to be looking forward to their future, gaining independence, pursuing their dreams, and instead they're they're looking at a very difficult future where, you know, there's a, a sense that the quality of life is being diminished by climate disruption and other forms of environmental loss. But, you know, for people who are experiencing climate impacts firsthand, that that might actually manifest as something more like trauma, right? So one student I remember from about a year and a half ago was, you know, she's from Malawi and uh, she was home with her family when I think it was uh, Cyclone Anna. It was one of the, the recent cyclones. That, there have been many that have, that have hit Malawi. But she was trying to do her schoolwork, and uh, she had no power or water in the house. And and then on top of that, there was just the trauma of other neighbors actually having lost their homes. And she she wrote me during finals week to say, how can I focus on my schoolwork when all I can think about is how are we going to survive this week, let alone live through the next 30 years in Malawi? You know, but I have students that are even here in Washington state and their parents maybe, for example, live in the east side of Washington and work in agriculture and are dealing with the extreme heat and pollution from, from wildfires during the summer that's compromising their health. And so, you know, st students that are actually experiencing the uh, assault on the bodies of people in their families or themselves as a result of climate change. who's most likely to experience the emotional hardship of climate change. And it seems like it kind of impacts people across the board, but do we have research that indicates who's most likely to be affected? Yeah, I mean, I, poor and marginalized communities and, and communities of color are suffering the heaviest climate impacts and therefore the most dramatic emotional toll, right? And there are many reasons for this. One is just these are communities that are that already have inadequate access to, for example, affordable housing and health care or reliable emergency services, maybe even reliable drinking water, and not to mention, of course, inadequate access to mental health services. So that makes it far more challenging to recover from daily climate impacts, let alone a climate disaster or displacement, if that results like in the loss of one's home or job or a community or a loved one. 
Hurricane Katrina is one of the most extensively studied American disasters to date. And when you pull back for a wide shot, the scene is nothing short of apocalyptic. 80% of New Orleans, including much of downtown, is underwater. And so the American Psychological Association showed that in the aftermath, we had something like one in six people impacted met the diagnosis for PTSD. And suicide or suicidal thoughts, you know, almost doubled for displaced people in New Orleans. But you don't have to be necessarily a survivor of a full-blown climate disaster to suffer from anxiety or grief in the face of, of climate impacts. You know, people are anxious about the impacts on their kids, on like the future of their own job security and where they're going to live. And then, of course, just the sense of powerlessness that comes up in, in thinking about an existential threat like this and how, you know, it could impact their jobs or livelihood or identities. For indigenous people, you have traditional hunting and cultural practices that are are being impacted and in some cases wiped out by by the warming climate. So Arctic communities are a really visible example of this, where people find that they can't travel to ancestral sites or they can't hunt in the old ways because the landscape is literally melting beneath them. And that's another group where suicide has, has risen um, dramatically. And so this really becomes a kind of a quintessential example of what we mean when, when we say that something is an existential threat. It's a threat to, to people's life and their survival, but it also a threat to identity and to culture and, and people's entire way of being in the wor- world. And so here, for example, in Washington state, that might be manifest around something like the huge decline in salmon from rising temperatures in our river. And of course, salmon are integral parts of the past and present cultural identity for for Coast Salish people. So as catastrophic as this is for indigenous people, the climate crisis is really just the most recent chapter in a long history of existential threats from colonialism and, and racism. You're writing a book with Sarah Jaquette Ray. I was reading one of her critiques of how we talk about climate change, which is that it does center around whiteness. And in your research about eco-anxiety and climate grief, have you found that to be the case, that when we talk about these topics, it tends to come from and center around a white perspective? You know, I, I guess it, it it depends on what conversations you're having, right? And there, there, you're absolutely right that there's a lot of debate among climate emotion experts about, you know, is, is climate anxiety mainly a white thing? Is it something experienced by people who may never have experienced other forms of existential threats and who will be the last to feel the effects of climate change? Um, so in that version, when we talk about climate anxiety, maybe that's some something that's experienced or something that people are most worried about when they think of an unknown future. So their dread really is a kind of a, a testament to how isolated they've been um, so far. But actually, the research in the U.S., including some really big studies that came out of the um, Yale Center for Climate Communications, show that communities of color are much more worried about climate change than their white counterparts. And that makes sense because, you know, as I noted, people experiencing climate change the most are going to feel the most anxiety about it. I I think the question really just depends on what do you mean by climate anxiety? Is it an abstract fear about future loss or is it something more like actual trauma from the harm that's being experienced right now? So I think what we need to be asking is, you know, do particular groups or individuals have anxiety because their comfortable way of life is threatened or because their actual survival is threatened? You know, based on, uh, I think, Sarah's writing, when she talks about uh, white climate anxiety, for example, she says, well, this really can go in very different ways, that distress can be channeled towards recognizing that climate change comes from and exacerbates racism. And so therefore, you know, addressing one is going to require us to address the other. But then you have other cases where we see climate anxiety lead towards fear and othering and rising incidences of ecofascism. So, you know, the mass shootings in Buffalo and El Paso and, and Christchurch, you actually had documentation and statements from the shooters who said that 
you know, they felt that it was partly in response to ethnic invasion and overpopulation and environmental degradation. Today, eco-fascist rhetoric has been adopted by far-right groups around the world, who are now co-opting concerns around overpopulation, globalization, and the climate crisis to spread their own xenophobic messages. So I think climate anxiety really can cut both ways. It's a pretty complicated story that we're seeing unfold. And in your work, you have a podcast called Facing It, and you talk about some of the emotional turmoil that comes with the effects of climate change. How do you talk about these topics on your podcast? And then the next step, how do you sort of reassure people to move forward and potentially take action? I think a lot of it really boils down to you know, helping people remember that the level of grief or anger that we feel corresponds to the level of love that we feel for what's being lost. And so it can be really liberating to just hold on to that reminder and reframe our perspective that when we're in pain, that's a, an opportunity to recognize that there's a mobilizing element beneath our distress and our discomfort, that we should see it as a wake-up call, that the planet is in trouble and we need to immediately get moving to accelerate the shift towards renewables and get off fossil fuels. So I think really to work through all of that in any given moment, there's three main strategies that that I've I used in my work, and these boil down basically to acknowledge, connect, and act. The first is to acknowledge and validate your feelings. It's really, really crucial to give ourselves permission to feel our feelings, whether that's sadness or fear or outrage, because those are those are very appropriate, even moral responses. And refusing to acknowledge our pain is just another form of denial. And then that can prevent us from accepting the whole truth and the reality of the losses we're facing. But also accepting hard emotions isn't the same as surrendering to despair. And in fact, we're, we're better equipped to take action and to get involved in climate solutions if we aren't expending all of our energy trying to suppress feelings. Uh, the second step is to connect with other people. So people's emotional distress about climate change becomes much harder to deal with when you know, we think we're the only one who feels so alarmed. And it creates a sense of isolation that can actually magnify depression and withdrawal. And that's not only hard on individuals, but it's also bad for society because research shows that when people feel alone, they're much less likely to take action and push for solutions because it just feels too overwhelming if you think you're the only one doing something. It, it really can be as simple as talking with your friends about distress, right? And chances are they're feeling it too. So it might be really validating for them as well. If people are looking for something more structured, there are groups online where people support each other around climate climate fears and, and anxieties. Step three is to take action, right? I, action does really help counteract that sense of helplessness that can trap us in a cycle of despair. Action can take so many different forms. You know, it can mean doing something through the arts or making changes to decarbonize your workplace or getting involved with a service project to restore forests or, you know, bringing solar to your school. It can, it can look vastly different for everyone. I think the key is really just to start where you are and prioritize what you're good at and what aligns with your interests so that you don't lose motivation over the long term. You can be making a contribution from wherever you're at already. You don't need to be somebody necessarily who's marching in the streets or giving speeches up on a stage. I try to remember to emphasize that getting to that step of collective action is the real point behind all the other steps, like co connecting with like-minded people. You know, we're not just coming together so everyone can feel good about the end of the world in a group. The goal is to help each other move beyond that paralysis and towards solutions. And there's a really important psychology behind this. When a person joins a group or an organization that's focused on a shared goal, they feel like they're part of a team. And in this case, really part of an entire global movement, which increases the likelihood that you'll stay engaged in the work. Because with something as vast and overwhelming as climate change, we often feel like our individual impact is just too insignificant to matter. So people throw up their hands and they decide they can't do anything at all. But if we see ourselves as working collectively, it's much easier to recognize that our individual contribution actually is part of a much larger movement for change.
ultimately, there's only so much that we can do at the individual level to slow the effects of climate change. And from your perspective, what are some of the bigger picture things that need to happen to curb its impact? We're not going to fix this one vegan dinner at a time or one sustainable toothbrush purchase at a time. Those are those are fine and those are great to have. But I, I really like a, a quote from Bill McKibben recently where he reminds us that the best thing an individual can do is to be a little less of an individual. If we shift towards thinking collectively, it's not only politically powerful, but it's also psychologically very helpful, right? Because it it prevents us from getting bogged down in the guilt and all of these kind of individual actions that... It, you know, eventually people just end up feeling a, a sense of despair and overwhelm because you, when you look at the problems, they're so big that your bamboo toothbrush is not is not going to be the thing that's going to solve that, right? But at the same time, you know, we don't dismiss personal action altogether because, you know, some of the research has actually shown that some of the most powerful elements of personal action is that it's a social signal. So research in psychology shows that one of the most powerful predictors of behavior change is not facts and information, but it's what we see others around us doing. I never want to dismiss fear and grief and anger as legitimate responses because they really do arise from a healthy source of caring about the world and refusing to be emotionally okay with all of the suffering and destruction. But other emotions like pleasure, humor, joy, even irreverence, I, I think those should be part of the conversation as well. And it, it helps just to remember, I think, that it's possible to feel many contradictory emotions at once. And it would bring more people into the climate movement, not to mention sustain those who are already involved, if we recentered pleasure and joy in this work and took our cues from social movements and from people who've been doing this work for a very long time, where we just see historically no movement for change has lasted for very long when misery and shame were the driving feelings behind it. Successful social movements find a way to make at least some parts of that activism a pleasure to take part in, whether they're involving music or art or creativity, and then above all, building community. So this is what makes the work a restorative experience and allows us to feel connected to each other and, and have a shared sense of, of purpose. So that work is still going to be difficult, but if it feels good in addition to feeling difficult, that's how we get more people to join and, and get more people to, to stay involved. Thanks for listening to Crosscut Reports. This episode was reported by me, Malia Sayed, with help from Sarah Hoffman. It was produced by me and Isaac kaplan Wolner. The story editor was Ryan Famuliner. Our executive producer is Sarah Menzies. To learn more about how our changing planet is affecting our mental health, be sure to check out the most recent episode of Human Elements on climate therapy. You can watch it at crosscut.com or at kcts9.org. You can subscribe to Crosscut Reports wherever you listen. And whatever platform you're listening on, please review us. We'd love to know what you think of the show. Also, if you would like to support the work we do at Cascade PBS, whether it's our lineup of podcasts, the video docu-series we stream every week, or the in-depth reporting we deliver every day, go to crosscut.com slash membership. In addition to supporting our journalism, members receive complete access to the on-demand programming of Cascade PBS. For the latest political, environmental, and culture news from the Pacific Northwest, visit crosscut.com. Crosscut Reports is a product of Cascade PBS. I'm Malia Sayed. We'll be back soon with another episode.